Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar as part of the series A Nudge and a Push Towards Ethical Sustainability in an Era of Invisible Data Harvesting. Welcome to University of Greenwich, our, webinars, our webinar setup, and my name is Ghislaine Boddington and I'm a reader in digital immersion here at the University of Greenwich and I'm also creative director for the Body Data Space Collective. I'm the lead curator for this webinar series, and this is the last webinar in this four-part series linked to DATUM R&D, an Innovate UK pro funded project. This project is a partnership between University of Greenwich, ZUK and Body Data Space. And that partnership has two outputs, DATUM Audio and DATUM AR. This evening, though, we're not going to talk about these projects specifically, but about the concerns and issues at the base of these projects. The previous three webinars have debated aspects and issues linked to remote intimacy, to consumerism and to gaming in relationship to this overarching key topic of data harvesting. This evening, we are going to have the webinar the sustainable and ethical usage of body data in immersion environments. And we're going to finalise the series with a discussion about the use of body data gathered from our daily technologies with plans to move forward in the new academic year with further debates, sym symposiums and activities in this topical area. So, welcome everyone. I welcome both you on Zoom and on the YouTube Live. And before we start, I have a few instructions to share here. As this is a webinar format, format, only the voices and faces of the speakers and myself can be seen and heard across the next one and a half hours. Yet we have aimed to make these webinars as interactive as possible. And so we have, across all four webinars, created what we're calling an active chat box. And both in the YouTube and the Zoom live streams, there will be an active set of stuff going on in the chat box. And we encourage you all to share there too, at relevant points through the webinar, links to your own projects, to reports or to articles, etc., relating to the topic of today's webinar. And from these, we'll be creating a resource document to be published online alongside the recording of the webinar on the University of Greenwich Research Space YouTube site in a week or so. The active chat box will also have inputs from our moderators throughout. Biogs and links for the speakers will be put up just as they come up to present and other links to references made during the talks. The two chat box from Zoom and YouTube will also be crossed over by our moderators. So don't worry, you will see it live as you go. Now, one thing I'd like you all to do would be to just check now your chat box settings and change and make sure that you're going to send anything you put in it to the blue box called panelists and everyone. Not just to the panelists, because nobody will see those at all. We need it to go into the everyone box. So do check that now and get yourself in the right place. And I'm actually going to ask you all to put in some own links now, weaving in here, where you are, say hello from us, and where you are joining us from. There's a few additional experts on this topic who are joined, joined this evening too, so they will act as that chat box activators too. So, you can start to say now who you are, and we know from the registration list people are here from many countries. This is one huge advantage of using teleconferencing for these knowledge exchange events. The chat box knowledge resource outputs will be used onwards, for lecturers, staff and students at the University of Greenwich and for others around the country and internationally. A document of today reflecting June 2021 and our topical knowledge of this theme. It's a valuable tool towards worldwide push for a debate that is of a global concern. And we will share these links with you and the video archives of all four webinars with you next week. The second way that you can interact with us is through the question and answers box. Do drop questions in here and or upvote questions as you feel. These will come up in the second half of the webinar after all of our presentations. 
And bear with me because as a moderator, I am going to cluster questions and not bring in every question individually to make sure that we get the right questions to the speakers at the end. One note just to say, no techie techie questions tonight, please. We are going to focus on ethics and sustainability in this, web, in this webinar. And also please do tweet. The hashtag is hash nudge push 21. And I think one of the moderators will pop that into the chat box for you now. Now I'm going to shift from moderation mode into my from 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 my housekeeping mode into my moderation mode. And first of all, I welcome our speakers and I'm then going to give you a quick context overall of the event itself. So behind the scenes at the moment, we have Mark Roland Miller from the Virtual Human Interaction Lab in Stanford University and Anna Luisa Shafgotsch, CEO and founder of Impli, Implantable Healthcare. Serena Tabachi, who is the co-founder and director of Mokta, the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art, and Shiv Malik, the CEO of the Pool Foundation. This webinar series has focused particularly on participatory, inter interactive and immersive experiences. Yet we are well aware that these issues be we are raising are for far wider sector considerations. So for this last webinar in the series, I've brought together experts from the arts, creative industries, academia and policymaking, a diverse mix of specialists to share an exchange on the topic of the fast advances in body data harvesting in the 2020s and the unclear scenario over its ownership. The harvesting and post-experience usage of personal data gathered through participatory sensor-based interaction needs debating in depth in the creative industries as many companies, small and large, are involved in biometric data gathering without giving much attention to the sustainable use and the ethical use of the data itself. This invisible harvesting has become highly topical in recent years, and we see much in the papers about the growth of surveillance technologies, such as facial recognition and biometric gathering through apps and wearables. It's actually started with the mass uptake of smartphones. That was the changing point for biometrics, put in place actually for our security and privacy reasons and many of us today open our phones with our faces or with our thumbprints. Additionally, the increase in fitness has led to a body moderation, our personal body moderation, through tech tools of the quantified self. Fitness, sleep, dietary apps, very popular today and I'm sure many of you have wearables or use your phones to count your steps, watch your sleep patterns, etc. The Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal, which broke the world news in 2018, started around 2013 actually, suddenly made us much more aware of the potential misuse of our personal data being held by the apps we use daily. In that case, the personal data of 87 million Facebook users, the majority without permission, were used, causing a worldwide debate about corporates making profits, and or governments winning elections on the back of our data. And the rising debate about surveillance and in particular about facial recognition technologies has created concern in a wider public too, with examples of our per personal identification biometrics of our faces being taken without our knowledge and potentially being sold on by private security firms and others to, for example, police forces. Yet, at the same time in China, it has become part of everyday life to use your face, to pay for your shopping, to enter your home or your workplace. It started to feel natural and it is part of the social credit system, a massive and seemingly very transparent government-led system. One issue may be for us in the Western world that we have a lack of transparency. Many experts today are starting to talk and tell us that exactly the same is happening for us as in China, but it's just not transparent at all, and it's not led by governments, but by corporates. And let's be clear, investors at this moment are acquisitioning biometric companies at the rate of knots, very fast indeed. 
My long-term work and involvement in the awareness of these up-and-coming issues is coming through my dance tech background, performing arts, where, since the early 90s, I have, within my collectives, been focusing on multi-identity while experimenting in motion capture, telepresence and connectivity, and location-based AR to enable communication between people across time and space, both in virtual and physical environments. This has led to my belief that we ultimately need more personal user control of our body data, and that we need to debate the potential solutions for this in a wider public. And it is clear today that our non-verbal behaviours can give us so much information which is of huge value. Data that's gathered from our non-verbal behaviour gives indicators about our beliefs, our attitudes and our emotions. These are being used for predictive economics to determine the next products and services that we supposedly want in our lives and therefore what makes most economic sense for businesses to build for us next. Now, Raza, could I ask you to put up my first polls, which are going to go up in the chat box. I've got two little questions that I'd like the attendees to answer. Are you concerned today about your body data being used by companies to predict your needs for product and services? Is the first one. So please do go ahead and answer that poll. And there's a second one in a minute. Now today, algorithmic bias, the hacking of medical and mental health information and other issues linked to body data privacy have moved into a much bigger private debate, pu public debate, in particular actually during COVID-19 and in relationship to contact tracing apps and digital vaccine passports. The place of our body, our agency, our presence, our senses, our effect is core to our identity in this world. And at the moment, our data is scattered and fragmented across the global data farms. Mass sustainability issues in that through the vastness of storage needs. The way to move forward is to look to the future of relationship between our physical selves and our data selves. And these are imperative decisions that we need to have a say in. Now, I can see from the um, poll results that 53% of you are highly concerned about your body data being used by companies to predict your needs and for products and services. And 29% are mediumly concerned, only 3% not at all. Raza, could I put up the second poll, please? Are you concerned about your body data being collected invisibly in public spaces when shopping or on a march and being sold to police forces and governments? This evening, our experts will discuss alternative emerging options and investigate innovative systems of ethical personal data ownership, of protection and of monetization. We're not looking for the ultimate solutions from our speakers here. If anything, we're looking for the next questions that we all must ask ourselves, that we all must look at the next research that we need to do, and the options for approaching to the future and different approaches we can do. Four speakers will present for five to seven minutes each, and then I will bring us back together to discuss the key themes of the webinar topic. I will add in from the question and answers box prior to the final statements. So, I think this quick poll is still going on. So I'm going to bring in, while we're waiting for that result, all oh, the results here. 78% concerned about our data being sold and stored to police forces and governments from it being gathered in public spaces. 19% mediumly concerned and 3% a little concerned. Nobody is not concerned about that. Thank you, that's really helpful. So, Mark Roland Miller, can I ask you to join us, please? Hello, Mark. Hi. I know that you're in Stanford in California, and I think it's quite early in the morning for you. So thank you very much for joining us. Mark is um, in his fifth year of his PhD at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab in Stanford. And I think his bio will have gone up in the chat room for you all to read now. And Mark has done some fascinating work with his team on the collection of data in VR. So I hand over to you, Mark, to present to us your findings. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I will share my screen here. Um, I will send a link to the paper in the chat right now. Um, but I'm very quickly going to go over uh, this paper as a as a point of discussion. It's kind of what I'm what I'm contributing to this uh, to the discussion here. Um, the slides are sketched as uh, Jilin said. Um, the focus is not on solutions, not polished, uh, wonderful ideas, uh, but the kind of questions that we're, we're going to ask in the future. So first I wanted to talk about what the kind of tracking data that I work with. So I'm part of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University. Um, my advisor is Professor Jeremy Balinson. Um, my program is human computer interaction. It's part of the computer science department, but I spend almost all of my time working in the virtual human interaction lab, which is a department of communication lab. So I'm sort of in between these two worlds, communication, media studies, behavior, psychology, and uh, computer science, mathematics, engineering. Um, and what I call tracking data is virtual reality can give you these uh, with the headset and the hand controllers give you XYZ three-dimensional position and uh, three-dimensional rotation. And uh, for uh, um, actually since uh, the early 2000s, um, Professor Balinson has been using this data as part of research studies, measuring interpersonal distance and things like that. But uh, with the now not too recent um, explosion of VR into the consumer scene and the, the, the massive increase in quality and decrease in price, uh, there's so much more data to go around. Uh, so one of the questions that I'm exploring in my, in my dissertation is what can you do with this data? So the work that I'm gonna talk about um, relies on, on two threads that are in research. One of them is computer science. One of them is from the sort of psychology and communication side. From the psychology and communication side, there's a growing nervousness of, of the power of VR tracking data. Um, some of the early work often has this form, here's some feature of movement that we can capture in, in VR data, and here's some medical diagnosis. For example, um, kids that are diagnosed with ADHD tend to have more motion um, in a classroom than kids that um, don't have that diagnosis. That's something that just appears out of this tracking data. And you could use that to predict um, and diagnose. The, the research paper was essentially saying, hey, what if we used VR to diagnose ADHD? Um, so it's one kind of thread of work that there, there is power in this tracking data. On the other hand, and in the space that I'm a little bit more familiar with, uh, or I have the background in, I should say, um, is the computer science side. Uh, of things. And um, there are, we're probably starting in 2015 or so um, saying, hey, here's something that people can do, some way people can move um, to make, um, to work like a motion password. So Jilin st uh, talked about faces unlocking our phones and fingerprints and, and all of that. And I, most of you are probably familiar with that. Uh, this is, hey, what if we have someone nod their head in response to a music clip or something like that? That was one idea kind of out there, but it, it was a, it's, it's a nice research project. But um, all of these papers are framed as, hey, we're going to pick the right task to get some identifying data out of someone. Um, you know, we're going to ask people to throw a ball. We're going to ask people to, you know, nod their head. We're going to ask people to walk. And in this research, um, what um, uh, my collaborators and I argued for was that tracking data by itself, um, by default, is identifying. And so getting a little bit into the um, study details, we had 511 people come into either the lab or a tech museum where we were also running the study. Everyone signed said, yes, we'll, we'll partake in the study. The study was originally about emotional content of 360 degree video. Each participant watched five of these videos. The videos lasted 20 seconds each. They also answered questions after each video saying, how happy or sad did you feel? How calm or intense did that feel? 
And um, through the whole time, we're tracking their motion data. That's just something that we've done. Um, we've had a little bit of interest in, say, matching head pitch, so up and down tilt of the head with uh, a motion. Um, and we're like, hey, maybe we'll do that with this. Um, but then after everything had been collected, uh, Jeremy goes, hey, uh, uh, my advisor, he, he says, hey, I've been hearing more and more about data privacy. We have this big set of data. I wonder if you can apply some machine learning and, and figure out how identifying this sort of data is. Um, and when I first heard it, uh, I was skeptical, but I, uh, it was <laughs> my advisor asked, so I decided to give it a shot. And I was surprised at how um, accurate this data could be to identify people. So what we did is we took um, four of those five videos for each person, um, trained a um, model a random forest model on um, this data. I'm just going to drop a name drop uh, random forest. Um, you really don't need to know the, the ins and outs of it. Um, but it was a machine learning model, learned uh, what people were doing in those four videos. And then we gave them um, 511 mysterious videos. They had to, the, the model had to guess who, what participant this was. And um, it did so with 95% accuracy. And I, I write down their chances 0.2%. So picture a multiple choice test, 511 questions. Each question has 511 potential answers and scoring a 95%. Um, pretty ridiculous, pretty unnerving. Um, I have to add a couple caveats because I do research. Um, people were just standing the whole time. They never took the headset off. So this is sort of a upper bound. This is. Um, not um, due to those factors may not be representative of you know taking the headset off and coming back three days later or you know playing a VR game or something like that. But the point and the point that is important here, uh, ninety five percent is the flashy number. The point is tracking data is identifiable by itself by default, um, and I think this sort of work supports that. So, um, in the interest of uh, kind of asking some questions. I know we're not going to jump to this discussion right after this, but um, questions that I'm interested in is what is identifying about the tracking data? In our study, we found it was height, hand pose, um, sort of distance from uh, 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 some content. So is it eyesight? Is it something like that? Um, what else? Um, what is the threat model? That's a term from the cybersecurity literature. Um, basically, who is the attacker that wants this data or, um, and uh, how, what powers do they have sort of technically to get access to it? How might this be abused essentially? And then finally, I just have the word what, because this is such a new and open space. And um, there's also issues of um, popularization and making this, you know, a topic that uh, people talk about, you know, when you come home from work and, and read a news story or something like that. So um, those are sort of three questions that I'm posing. And I think, uh, or that's, that's uh, my sort of introduction and I will be partaking in the conversation uh, in a bit. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and um, appreciate that input very much. Um, We'll come back, of course, to talk more about the, um, I think particularly your point about the threats as well, actually is very important and we'll come through again. So so now can I ask Anna Luisa Schafgotzer to join me um, and to um, introduce you, Anna Luisa, um, who is the CEO and founder of Impli and is going to talk about implantable healthcare, so embedded tech. So Anna, I'll hand over to you with your presentation. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, hi everyone, and I'm I'm delighted to be here. And so thanks, Mark. Great presentation um, about this today. I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about implantables and what we do in the space. Uh, Elaine already introduced uh, me. I run a company in, in the space, and of course, data for us is very important, and data security is 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 extremely important in this space as it is in, in internal tech. But hopefully I can stimulate a couple of questions out of this that um, we of course proposed ourselves and are continuing to pose ourselves within the company. But first of all, I want to um, just address the question, what is an implantable? Well, an implantable is an artificial object that's uh, implanted into someone's body. 
Um, and this has been done before uh, a lot in medicine uh, for different applications. So there's of course the pacemaker, um, that was the earliest uh, implant um, of, of its sort. You've got cochlear implants, uh, dental implants, the contraceptive. And so implantables have been in this world already generating data and sending data out of the body and, and in, into the world or use, utilizing them as functions that we so need them to. However, they haven't been much addressed beyond the medical sense and they haven't the data that comes from them hasn't been much addressed. There were a couple of um, <clears throat> cases where uh, hacked pacemakers were, for example, shown. And of course, these are very dire consequences because those are not devices that are taken off so quickly. So we need to think about this, but I want to really stimulate the thought around what benefit can they can they bring? The, why implantables come to face now and why we are in this position right now is because we evolved from, of course, uh, the early computers to uh, mobile phones to the first Fitbits in 2009, the Internet of Things in 2010, and suddenly moving through the optimized um, self movement and then, of course, the integrated human, um, where we utilize technology for those betterments. But really what comes out of this um, is a big question around um, how do we keep this data safe? Um, one of the points that I want to make uh, in, in, in the discussion that we have today um, and that I'm really excited about because it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about is really is implantable say, data really that less unsafe than what we have at the moment. So at the moment we've got facial recognition. Is that not much more invasive than, um, than an implantable where um, this cannot be detected from a camera that hangs above uh, our heads. The same, of course, uh, going into the Internet of Things and the connected things that are around us, um, or as, of course, Mark also just mentioned, kind of in the VR space, um, all of the micro movements of, of your face. Uh, there is a publication and several out there around being able to spot depression on people uh, with this. So, I think what we need to work towards and what I would love to discuss in, in our next discussion is really how can we protect the freedom and equality uh, within our society, yet allow the data to still be useful in order to evolve. And um, those are questions we've been asking ourselves, ourselves, of course, we've been using different technologies to solve this, uh, we're using um, uh, fast homomorphic encryption to encrypt all the data to empower patients. However, these questions are, of course, uh, beyond that. Um, the security question from Mark was extremely interesting um, uh, to pose, but there are also questions about how do we integrate with sharing this data. And I think this brings me also to this next point that we, of course, all know these concepts between centralized, decentralized or distributed networks is how do we build body data into these concepts? Where do we stay? Do we stay in a centralized system? This is what we have right now. So for example, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do in a second. Um, with Impli, you know, at the moment we've got a centralized uh, healthcare system. However, we're trying to build a decentralized one um, as this is more effective as people move around. But what about distributed networks and how can we make um, sure that we gain the advantage of this while still keeping privacy and safety up? Now, who we are simply, um, we are an implantable company. We launched our first um, implantable product in 2020 in March. Um, it's a small implanted device um, that carries medical healthcare records um, that enables its wearers to um, have their records on them at all times. This obviously means that we're moving away from a centralized system and allowing the patient to hold that data with them. And um, in our next generation of implants that we're building, we're very strongly moving towards sensor-based implants that enable us to um, capture um, data from internal, from uh, the institutional fluid, measuring different metabolites, therefore, and what we're doing. Just a quick, uh, a quick video, um, and I can send across, here we go, of um, one of our earlier um, adopters showcasing how that works and how that looks um, and what that means. Um, and um, coming up with his healthcare record through an implantable format. So thanks so much. And I'm really excited to the next uh, discussion and, uh, and, and to be able to solve some of these issues, but also get behind how we can solve uh, this uh, to be ethical and sustainable in the world that we live in, because I think that's uh, our obligation uh, to move forwards with implantables.
Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Anne-Louise. That's great. Um, so uh, we're going to move on forward. And um, thank you for those very clear inputs around the ethics and sustainability. And we'll come back to that. So now I'd like to ask Serena to join me. Serena Tabacci. Um, and to put her... Yep, great. Hello, Serena. Um, and Serena's actually working as a co-founder um, and as the director of MOCTA, the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art. And so we're coming from a very similar background, actually, us two working with digital arts at this moment. And um, uh, I'm very interested to catch up with you, Serena, who actually is in Milan at the moment working um, on the, the, the movements forward for you with MOCTA and how you're seeing the shift and we're what we're reading a lot about it in the digital art world at this point in time, particularly around data. So I'll hand over to you, Serena. Thank you so much, Gilan. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you to everyone who's been attending and to all the speakers. It's a pleasure to be um, with you. Um, so yes, today I will be talking about my experience as a co-founder and director of MOCTA, which is this museum uh, which exists primarily online, um, but we also do activities in IRL and I will talk about our activities in relation to the sustainability and ethical issues around digital art and the most recent uh, announced on the news NFTs. Um, so I will share my screen and um, talk to you more about MOCTA and what we do. I hope you see my screen now. Um, so just to give a bit of a context about digital art, which it wasn't born yesterday, but it's actually been uh, around since the, since the beginning of the 1960s when the first computers uh, became available to most of the public and artists started experimenting with computers in different ways. So they've um, sort of used computers as tools to create art, to, to create together with the machines. And so that relationship between humans and machines um, became uh, something that never existed before with something that we knew how it was created, but there was something hidden that, you know, sort of mysterious about the ways in which machines worked, even though were created by, uh, by man. Um, so definitely with the advent of blockchain most recently, um, technology allowed all that work that has been produced in collaboration with any digital element, whether it's been uh, the reproduction or the maintenance of an artwork created in collaboration with a machine, um, has been sort of legitimized in the sense that all the steps around the royalty systems and the uh, reward of the artist that has been having in relationship with the collectors, for example, has become way easier. Um, so that means that there's a direct relationship between the artist creating works in digital format and their audience. So at the museum, what we do as our mission is uh, adding into the discovering and experience of contemporary digital arts. That means in the in preserving the knowledge and the standards around digital arts, but also in the education part. So anything that is related around what artists create and how, and uh, also what the technology has been supporting in the conservation and in the collecting experience. So all of those areas are something that we're looking to and we try to share all that knowledge with the public. So we create those educational moments for people to learn more about this. Um, so some of our major activities are in relation to curatorial, to the creation of limited editions, to licensing um, through smart contracts for the editions in digital and physical format and art valuation. But something we're also going into is the creation of a museum in the form of a DAO, which stands for a decentralized autonomous organization, which will become our model for the museums of the future. So that will mean a participatory museum where artists, collectors, 
patrons, the general public and art enthusiasts, anybody who is interested in this movement can take part. And I'll explain this better uh, when I will touch around um, some ethical aspects around blockchain. So our team is a mix of um, art with art background and technology background. So we come together and we try to share our experiences in both IRL and URL places, so both online and offline. And we try to get the public involved as much as possible in this. The elements of innovations that we bring into the museum and in the relationship we have with the public is around the creation of those smart contracts. Those contracts, um, let's say digital contracts that interact with blockchain, which is these immutable ledger that preserves information locked into an immutable uh, archive that cannot be altered in time, not modified. Um, so that means that everything written there is transparent and immutable. Uh, but what we want to do is also having a curatorial team that would be integrated with this uh, DAO system, which will be this participatory way of uh, thinking of a museum for the future. Um, so the blockchain, which is a word that I think has been heard a lot in the past year, has facilitated what we know today as NFTs, which are those non-fungible tokens that can be associated with, um, for example, a digital artwork. So those tokens can be um, seen as the artwork that we're going to have in our permanent collection, for example, in the museum. But I wanted to bring to your attention the fact that blockchain has also been seen as something that consumes a lot. And um, two aspects in relation to this are that there's been a committee going on for uh, a few months now that has been putting together um, a lot of resources. And what we're moving on to now is something called proof of stake. So that means we're moving from a model uh, in which blockchain has been running on which has been more powered by machines. And so that means the, the, the power that machine had towards building those blocks into the chain uh, towards something that has more a human influence. That means people behind decisions. So that is um, less impactful on the environment and will bring better solutions for the way in which we're going to store information on the blockchain. So I hope that was uh, not too difficult. Uh, but we definitely have ethical considerations around, of course, the valuation and curatorial services that are going to be in relation to this DAO experience, so this decentralized and autonomous organization. And um, we are keeping on with our research in collaboration with universities around uh, applications into digital art within the use of blockchain. So now I also wanted to show you some images and videos around some experiences we had. Um, this is actually from last night. So taking you now into an actual museum environment in, uh, in virtual spaces. Um, so we opened this exhibition last night in Decentraland, which is a metaverse. And here it's interesting to see how people interact with one another. So those avatars can be customized and uh, people can talk to one another, interact and see works completely in a virtual environment and interact with the artworks because everything is, uh, uh, is accessible in different formats. Um, you can see how also the design and the sculptures and things within the space here, there's a sculpture as you see on slightly left hand side of the screen, is in a relationship with the public, virtual public in the room. And uh, this one is also another experience where you see the screen that is having the actual face of people participating in those environments. And so the relationship that we have now as humans um, in virtual environments, I think is extremely interesting because also all this data, it is collected in some ways um, and uh, is available then online to be re-watched, re-experienced. Um, so I think it's interesting to see how those things are actually um, um, you know, having an impact on us. And then I want you also to go through this virtual experience, which is in our museum as well. And 
let you see that in this experience, for example, is just us. So it's just the viewer, there's no people in the room and so we can browse through. So there's been a number of experiences that have been created during the pandemic that I think made us think about the relationship between um, humans and digital elements. And I think it's interesting to notice how this has been also impacting on our memory and uh, what we remember when we are online and when we are offline. So just to give you a little preview. Hello, Serena. Maybe I can get you to join me. Yeah, hello, great. So if you want to unshare your screen, um, thank you very much. That was a very good detailed input for all of us, which I think many of us would much appreciate actually having the, the, um, the depth of knowledge that you just put in because there's so much to catch up with nowadays. And we're all, we're all kind of slightly struggling with this. So um, now um, I'm going to bring on our last presenter, who is Shiv Malik. And Shiv, you have been working on solutions around these possible issues for quite a while um, in various roles. And at the moment, you've just started a new role as CEO of the Pool Foundation. And I know you're going to share with us more um, in relationship to actually what's partly been coming up now, the individual and the collective relationships and data side. So I'll pass over to Shiv. Great, I'll, um, I'll share my screen as they say. Okay. One Thanks. second. And let me just present. Great. Can you see my uh, first slide? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's great. So uh, I want to talk about really the sustainable uh, use of body or wellness data, if you want, taking that from the, the talk title. Um, and actually, like Serena, um, also um, from the Web3 space, and if I knew we were going to be talking about DAOs and smart contracts and proof of stake and NFTs, um, I think I might have changed my talk um, uh, only slightly. But um, let me first tell you what our mission is at Pool. So. This is our mission, data controlled by those who create it. So hopefully that's really quite clear and simple, but I think it entails uh, a world of difficulties uh, in, in many senses. Um, what we actually do is to help build, uh, host and grow entities called data unions. So uh, what's a data union? Well, we'll come to that in a minute, um, but I'm gonna make one assumption here. And we might want to discuss this because it might not be an assumption that everyone else shares. Uh, and that assumption is this, that human beings aren't simply privacy centric, right? We actually are pro-social beings. We've had a lot of talk about privacy in the last 10 years, and that's uh, all for the good um, until you get to the point where you realize, you know, people have now lots of systems in which to not share data, but actually very few systems in which they can actually uh, share data in the way that they would want to. Uh, and that's really very important. Uh, we share information about ourselves actually all the time, right? When we meet, when we talk, uh, when we message, when we write letters, does anyone write letters anymore? Certainly postcards, I wrote postcards the other week. Um, emails, uh, uh, we read books, we watch films, attend events, uh, like this one, right? We're sharing, all these mediums share information, or if you want to you know, call it by another name, data, right? Whether that be political or personal fiction, nonfiction, familial or global in scope. Um, so how does the data economy meet those same needs for or all involved, right, in a fair and sustainable and equitable way? Uh, and, and that's really important. I kind of rushed over that right? in a fair and sustainable and equitable way, because we don't have that at the moment at all, with the data creators in full consensual control of that process. Um, I think, as Ana Luisa put it, like, you know, how do we harness this data and respect privacy and security? So to understand how to do that, I first want to give a quick overview of the problems of today's data economy, just a very quick one. We all kind of know this thesis, so I'm really going to uh, go over it very quickly. Um, but perhaps from an angle that you haven't quite seen, which is also from the data buyer's perspective, right? There are people out there who actually, you know, big companies, uh, AI companies, 
um, uh, people doing machine learning research, uh, all sorts of people out there who actually want data to inform what they do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so first of all, and it's really worth thinking about this, personal data is a byproduct of digital activities, right? That makes it automatically almost of poor quality because it's a byproduct. It's not. It's never ever the product. You never go to an app and say, "Here's my data, and that's the purpose of the app," right? And leave it at that, right? It's always about enticing users uh, to do something else whilst collecting their data. Uh, it's harvested often in those formats and in that framework without explicit consent and creating obviously those huge issue, ethical issues that come with that. Uh, it, it's also locked up in silos. Right. So if you know anything about the data economy, you'll know uh, absolutely that, you know, there are a few big companies who basically lock up all of the, the raw data layer um, and, and no one else can get at it. And, it. and it equates great inequality and great power imbalances. That's why Google and Facebook and Amazon are as big as they are. It's because they've siloed the data to themselves and they use it to their advantage in one way or another. Um, and then two other bits, which you might not know. Uh, the a data economy as currently uh, has sort of basically run off these two things called cookies or uh, idfas uh, and there's various other mechanisms for basically spying on you. Those have come to a, an end. And so everyone out there who isn't basically Google, Facebook, et al, uh, are now panicking about what to do. So there's an opportunity here in a sense to remake the data economy. That's very exciting uh, for people like me in that sense. Uh, and then secondly, legislation is, is coming along. Uh, to kill the paradigm off, just in case it wasn't already killed by cookies and, uh, and these other mechanisms for spying on users also being deleted and stopped. Um, and that legislation by and large is now coming down the chute from the European Union. It's called the Data Governance Act, and there's a few other uh, draft acts uh, there uh, that will attempt to solve this problem. So you thought GDPR was interesting. These next three acts, uh, I won't list them all, um, are going to be even more interesting as such. Okay. so. What is, if you want, the solution to all of this? Well, actually, I think it's pretty simple. Instead of spying on users to collect the data, just ask them, right? Just ask them if they want to share it and then reward them when they do, right? It's really that simple. Um, and it's astounding, actually. It's been technologically very difficult to actually build that out. You need a lot of parts to come together, including, um, uh, you know, smart contracts and micropayments and all those other things. But now that those are in place, you can actually start to fulfill that very simple proposition. So as promised, um, I'd explain what a data union is. Um, I know that's what you've all been waiting for. So a data union is a digital organization that aggregates data from creators into a single product. When that data product sells, value is shared between its members and the operators of the union, right? So it's, it's uh, basically running off that simple proposition, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's a new model for data buyers who want to purchase real-time streams of raw data for people who want it to be used. So that would include body data. Uh, in fact, it enveloped that almost perfectly. Uh, and it's also a new model for data creators, right? Like you and I, uh, we create data all the time to control and share the value of that data. Uh, and it's a model that's backed by this new legislative framework that's coming down from the European Union. Um, uh, they call them data cooperatives, but um, uh, it's the same thing, ultimately. Uh, and they already exist, which is also really exciting. So I'll just list three that already exist. Uh, there's um, a GODB, which is a geolocation uh, application on your mobile phone. They, uh, uh, and they have about 12 million users or 100 thousand users, depending on how you count them. Obviously, that's quite a large difference in metrics. You should probably change that number. Uh, there's Tap My Data, which does general consumer data. Um, uh, and they have about 9,000 users, so small. And Swash, uh, which is a browser analytics plugin. It just sits in, in your browser. Uh, you can download it as an extension on Chrome or Firefox or whatever you use. And they have about 40,000 users. Uh, so they exist already, uh, and they're already returning value back to their members, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and this is all in a kind of pre-legislative mode. And I think when the legislation kicks in, things will start to be governed properly. Privacy will be built in, obviously, from the very start. Uh, uh, and then you'll end up with interesting ways in which to pass revenue and, and, and governance back. Uh, Serena was talking about DAOs. Well, you can easily have a data union that's a decentralized autonomous organization as well. Um, and we've already sort of built for that plan, uh, you know, in about two, three years time. So that's really fascinating. Um, I just want to give you one case study and then I'll wrap up. 
Uh, I want to give you what we had as a, a health data union or wellness data union. So, you know, you all know about wearables. Um, one wearable that's on the market at the moment has uh, an open API. So it's a Withings watch. And, uh, and from that watch, you can actually get a whole slew of health uh, data metrics like heart rates and sleep quality. And uh, I think you can get ECG as well. They have an open API, so you can port your data to anywhere you want. And that's how it should be for all wearables, by the way, because it is your data. Um, uh, you know, other applications out there don't allow you to do that, but they've taken a different thing. And I think eventually the law will change that, um, that, that, that situation anyway. Uh, so you can port that data into a data union, right, for research purposes, uh, and you can start to have preferences like, I'll only want to sell to researchers at universities. Great. I'm happy to sell to anyone. Uh, that might want it, like an insurance company who might want to start to model new insurance products uh, off of this aggregate data, and then maybe even start to come back to you and go, well, okay, you've also stored that data, let's say. Uh, we know which exact insurance product you want for your health insurance, um, because we know that we've got the data right there. And the wonderful thing is that you can use privacy technology, uh, privacy enhancing technology that already exists, like, so you don't, they don't have to take your data, they can just, uh, basically do it in a, what's known as a zero knowledge way. So they uh, write a query um, and, uh, and they question the data set without taking the data away from you or even seeing it actually themselves. Very clever, very smart, and very therefore privacy preserving. So this offers, I think, data unions offer a really interesting framework in which to make body data sustainable. It's obviously opt-in, so people only opt-in uh, into, into a data union. Uh, and if you don't wanna be part of it, great, don't. Uh, and I think that's a really good start. Uh, and then obviously once you're part of a, a member, uh, a data union like this, you have professionals worrying about how to retail this data for you, worrying about how to preserve your privacy. Uh, and that's as it should be, because data is really complicated and no individual is gonna be able to do it on their own, hence a union. Thanks. Thank you. Fascinating. And I'm going to bring everybody back in now of um, all the speakers to turn their videos and microphones on and join Shiv and I. Um, great. There's Mark, Serena, Anna. <laughs> great. Wonderful. So hopefully the audience can see all of us um, and I can talk to all of you. So um, I'm going to actually start... Um, with start with the ethics side and go into that a bit. And then I'd like to do some talking about sustainability too, although I know they're both going to cross over and move back and forward. But first of all, in relationship to this um, area of accountability and this tension that there is between really us as individuals, collective needs for shared data and data for good. And then also the tension between corporates and governments that is happening means we, it is quite clear, and from all of your inputs, we've got to get some more ethics in space, uh, into a place. So so we're, we're our physical selves and we've got our data selves, and we're very fragmented all over the place. And we've heard today from Serena about certain um, decentralised systems, from Impli, Anna, Louisa, about decentralised systems, and also from Shiv about um, the uh, new data unions. So... Um, I'm going to just stop one minute because I can see some messages going into a chat room saying that people can only see me. So um, can I double check that with the technical team to check um, that you actually, it looks like what you probably should do is go to gallery at the top of your Zoom. Yeah, rather than do a speaker and then you should be able to see all of us. I hope that's right for everybody now because that's really important. So. So to go back into the group, Anna Luisa, I was just going to ask you, in relationship to the encryption at the back end of the Impli um, implant, of which I'm going to tell everyone I've got one here. Actually, I have an Impli implant, and I you you saw the um, iPhone. It's an iPhone. I use it with interface into the app. Can you tell us a bit more about the moves that you're going forward with? Because I know that as a company and personally yourself, you've been deeply involved in looking at this area. And as you mentioned, privacy and freedom is really important for you. 
Um, absolutely. Um, that's very right. So we obviously are an ethically run a company with implantables. So in conjunction with implantables, that's uh, something that we see as necessary uh, and holding these values. Um, we are looking at, of course, many different technologies to overcome this and to understand this. When we did market research um, at the very beginning of founding the company, we asked about 400 people uh, in the EU and asked them if they wanted an implant, what, what were they most, most concerned about? And data security by far, by far outreached everyone's uh, fears around implantables and what they reached. So um, it was really one of the core focus points. And of course, Ghislaine just mentioned, uh, we were utilizing an algorithm with fast homomorphic encryption to encrypt the data um, that we have on our platform so um, that it can only be actioned by the implant other um, parts of the business we're looking at uh, blockchain technologies um, where we can uh, apply those and therefore hold a, um, a, a a very true chain this is particularly important maybe in healthcare where it's really important to uh, pass medical information onwards when you are in an emergency. Um, for example, if you're traveling abroad, um, they wouldn't have your healthcare records, but that might be something extremely valuable when treating you on the spot. So there are different applications of this. It's something that we are continuously innovating on. It's something that's extremely important, um, yet because it hasn't been really addressed um, only slid into the era of data where this has become a problem because there's so much data available and so much data harvested. Only quite recently, if we think about the development of, um, of, of where we are, so. Yes, no, it's true. I think um, if we're- If we find standardization. Sorry. We're, lo we're losing you a little bit, actually, anna Louise. so just slightly breaking up. So I was just going to add in there the, I believe, I've seen figures recently that say the amount of data that's been um, created in the world in the last two years is, you know, as kind of more than has ever happened before at all. We are really, really increasing it. Mark, give me, you know something, you've got some figures here for me or something to back me up there. Just the exponential growth of data and, um, you know, all, all the all the technological uh, things that lead to that. that. That's all I was nodding to. It's just very true. Yeah. Yeah, and that we will, we, that's the point really to carry through in our discussion into the sustainability issues, because we know these are mass data farms that are gathering these, this data and causing part of the climate change issues. Um, so, so um, Shiv, do you think that your data union idea, um, which actually I, um, in our work with Body Data Space, we've been talking about a kind of personal data dashboard where we would have an opt in, opt out for, um, many years we've actually always put this forward um which would allow us to opt in to sharing data for good so for things like the covid vaccine development etc but would also allow us to opt out from maybe a corporate we didn't like you know or to actually say to a business i'll opt in my data but i'd like a bit of payment for it like you get on a loyalty card at the supermarket but um how do you think your the data union model the, the examples you gave us could work for something like Impli. Yeah, so uh, just to make a comment, I kind of, you know, there've been lots of ideas about how people can control and therefore garner value from their data. And I think the, the what was known as PIMS, Personal Infinite Information Management Services, um, was the kind of idea that was uh, much talked about about four or five years ago. Um, and lots of people built them, but it turns out very few people actually want to sit there day in, day out managing their data. They don't want people en masse don't want data dashboards because uh, I mean, I don't. So and I work in this field. I'm like, just, you know, whatever. Right. And once in a while, I might want to, like, have a sneak peek and that's fine. Um, uh, but day by day, that's not what I want to do. I have a busy life like everyone else. Um, so how do you actually uh, then get people, incentivize them to share data? Because it is useful for, for, for society at writ large, right? Everyone here has probably uh, utilized aggregate data sets. Now, if uh, no one wanted to do that, none of you would have a job and none of you would be creating value in society for the rest of everyone else, right? That's just really clear. So we need it. Uh, and people do want to do it, right? So um, getting that system right, I think is really key. With Impli, I think it would be really simple um, in, in many ways. If people, I think 
you'd have to create a much more rigorous framework for opting in. So people really knew what they were doing. But presumably, if you've already gone and had something implanted in you, you probably know what you're doing already uh, when it comes to sharing that data. You'd have to, at the data union level, the, the people administrating it, the, the data union operators, uh, as we call them, they would also have to be very serious professionals with an ethical board. Uh, most of these data unions do actually have something like that already. And, and, and adhering to higher legislative requirements uh, when it came to then, when they had that opt-in aggregate live stream of your implant, giving you whatever information it might be, great. Then who do they retail that to if it is retailed at all? It might just be that it's an, permissioned on an altruistic basis for everything. So I, I think it works. Um, and I'd actually be excited to then have a chat with Anna Luisa afterwards uh, as to whether that might be something that people want. Yeah. No, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, it's very interesting. Sorry, Galen. No, go for it. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. We thought about this model before. It's really difficult in healthcare, right? In healthcare, you are dealing with data that is even more sensitive. Um, and you're dealing with people that are even less able to sometimes un know or understand what's going on because they are in a vulnerable position. So um, there, there is a lot about this and we've been thinking about this and um, the monetization of kind of data and the ability to opt in always has to you know, assume that the person understands what they're doing, understands what that means, understands where they're giving their data and what the consequences of that may be. And that's what I find really tricky to get a hold on and to understand how to find that Equal, equilibrium balance where you actually protect people from making bad decisions and giving away, you know, we, an example with Facebook at the beginning loaded every single photo uh, of themselves. Um, and now everyone's much more safe, safe, safety concerned around this. So I think um, maybe we need to go through a phase like this. It is interesting there where you said if people in healthcare, you're right, in medical, medical is the most private data. It proved that people really, really are sensitive. And that's why we've had such a reaction to contact tracing apps and to um, these digital vaccine passports all over the world, different countries. And people have gone, hey, hang on a minute. You know, this is my this is me, you know. Um, but the, interesting, the questions you bring up around the healthcare are the ones that we really need every company to be asking aren't they around the data ethics and Shiv you were going to add in there too. I was just going to say you know uh, uh, Annalise is obviously right healthcare is probably the most problematic uh, and actually things like Facebook data are also really problematic especially the way it's structured you can't just pull your own Facebook data because it turns out it's interconnected with lots of other people's data as well um, but actually most types of data aren't like that so your Spotify playlist data probably fine to share right most people wouldn't have a problem like sharing their music tastes in fact they probably want to do that uh, and because so, they think their tastes are the best so you know uh, that's less far less problematic right um and and there's lots of other data sets that are at that level rather than let's go in at the uh you know incredibly sensitive health medical records level um yeah so actually then um, turning to the art sector and the digital art sector and actually creative industries, because a lot of the immersion experiences that we are working with, are obviously, they're not just with artists. They are actually in creative industries sector overall and into much bigger businesses now, too. But Mark and um, Serena, how would you see a data union scenario working in relationship? Let's go to Mark first in relationship to say, say you were setting up a small VR company now. Yeah. Um, or, or VR and AR, yeah, which maybe you are because there's a lot of this new stuff coming out. So how could you see that kind of data union or one of these models working for you? Yeah, um, so I'm going to pivot. I don't picture myself starting up a company, but I will I will uh, bring this up to the buddy of mine who is. But I, it, I do think it, it certainly can be relevant when it comes to um, a research study. So um, like I said, you know, we had 500 people come into this research study. We have their data. We, there's, there's no way, you know, to, to sort of give them any insights that we get from this data. Uh, yes, it diffuses through research and through classes and, and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, say five, 10 years down the line, um, we can have people say, yeah, we do. I, I do want to um, know that like 
oh, I'm more, uh, I, I don't even know what to think because this is this is research. Who knows what that what that data will will say? You know, maybe it'll say, hey, you know, you check a box to say, hey, maybe recommend me for a, uh, a diagnosis for ADHD to 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 bring that back to to the um, earlier point of of tracking data in ADHD. Um, maybe not that in particular. You know, I don't I. I kind of wonder who, you know, maybe in the chat, let me know, would you be interested in that? Would you be horrified by that? <laughs> what would you hit on, on that checkbox? Um, and uh, the, uh, the idea here of, of how in research can we still allow people to um, access, access their data and, and make use of it? And again, you know, what are the uses? That's a very good question, let me know. But um, I, I do think that there is there is potential there, and having the data unions as kind of a, a framework um, allows uh, so much um, that uh, just has not been thought about. It's been you know talk about silos. You know, yes, there's all this sort of power structure when it comes to Google, Facebook, and Amazon having so much data, um, but all the data within uh, or a lot of the data within research is siloed as well. And uh, how I, I feel like there's an opportunity there. I haven't had a lot of time to think about that, but there feels like there, there's a match. So then actually <clears throat> we know that um, with the only real regulation as Shiv mentioned is the EU regulation GDPR at the moment. That's the only real one in the world actually at the moment. And we do know that the EU is, is concerned in debating regulation around facial recognition and around the ethical use of AI at the moment. There's some new reports out on that, actually. So um, let's hope that Britain stays in there alongside it. Well, now we've done the Brexit thing, because um, we were actually at the base of the development of GDPR. I'm hoping that that stays in place. But um, uh, we also then were hearing from Serena about these other decentralised methodologies, which we're seeing a lot in the press about, which most of us are still trying to get our heads around, the decentralised ones. So just to come to you, Serena, in relationship to the kind, can you see these types of models for artists, say, and creative, small creative businesses making immersion works or like some of the things you showed us, possibly being able to work in a data union style model? Um, and how, I know that not all artists are the same. Let's take that for clear. We're not talking about everyone who's an artist is altruistic and everyone who's a corporate isn't. That is not true, we know. But we do have quite a few artists in the audiences and audience here. Um, <clears throat> Luke Hockesne, who's from uh, Montreal, has asked about our digital identity. And he's saying it would seem normal not only to own our data, but also to own a source of our data, the digital self. Yeah, which is part of the discussion I'm often on. Um, so, Serena, you're saying that the, the methods that you're working with actually do link to the source of the data as well. Is that right? Yes, yes, I can share some of that um, from my experience and um, more specifically, I know Shiv also mentioned about DAOs and uh, those part of technology I, I've talked briefly before, so I hope that wasn't too confusing. But what I meant is that there's been a shift towards a more power, machine power generated influence towards data versus a more human, um, centered, let's say, way of including data. And in that sense, the formation of DAOs, to me, it showed a huge interest in participating in that type of experience, also from an artist point of view. But what I've also been noticed, which I don't think has been traced anywhere, but it's from my personal experience, is that after a huge enthusiasm from people in participating in those kind of like um, um, incentives and terrains for joining those types of decentralized and, and anonymous as well, types of um, participatory and engaging ways of responding to data, uh, there's a drop in, in participation, which is interesting to notice. So to summarize that, there's a huge interest to start with in how the data is going to be used and how that data can influence those organization. But after a while, we tend to see a drop in interest, which to be honest, I'm still trying to understand how and why. But I think it's a type of commitment that people have to sort of get into 
you know, their mindset. So in my experience, I see that there's a huge influence from artists as they come from a more creative uh, background and they used to keep experimenting in new fields. Uh, but I think in terms of bringing the general public into this type of mindset, it will require an effort from all of us. So AI and data um, can be influenced by all of us, but there needs to be a, a, a constant willingness to, to not be lazy in that sense. So I hope that that's the way going forward. We have a couple of comments actually from um, attendee Hannah Redler Horse, who um, works at the ODI, the Open Data Institute. And actually, first of all, Serena, she does um, ask you about your point that um, with AI and blockchain, digital art has become more become disruptive to the arts world. And she would say digital art has been disruptive for a while. But she also brings up in the chat box an interesting um, point around unplanned diagnosis of the conditions of these systems and maybe I could put that back into the whole how do we actually know she finds it slightly alarming because of the fudge in the consent and um, saying as diagnostic tools that these these are these systems are interesting to talk about but actually how do we really understand the back end and the, and the, the, the condition of these systems we're we still in a real testing place there Yes, absolutely. I think it's mainly about the ways in which those are communicated. And I think that's been a lot of noise on the news and a lot of information that's probably been um, not interpreted in the correct way. And I think all the noise that blockchain and NFTs have brought to the news has definitely been um, not going in favor towards all of these. And I totally understand and agree on the fact that digital art has been disruptive since the late 60s. Um, I think what has been facilitating is not just in the market, in the art market um, uh, field, but is also in supporting and legitimizing the work of so many people working in digital that had troubles dealing with copyrights and with royalties. So I think that's been going in support of that type of category. So it's more about how digital art has been um, enjoyed, but also shared across the internet. I think blockchain doesn't solve all the problems. I think it goes in support to maybe 60, 70% of what still need to happen, but it's a step forward. Great, because I know that Hannah's um, uh, a big digital art um, curator and knows her stuff well. And I agree with both of you on that, coming from that sector too. So, um, so on the sustainability side, yeah. Um, Mark, have you got some add in there to do for us with your knowledge around data and sustainability? Can you tell us a bit more about how it's working in the world, this? Yes. Yeah, so um, one thing that I think we touched on just a little bit, um, but something uh, that um, comes up is, is where is this data stored and, and how is this um, data accessed? And uh, as data explodes, um, there are issues of, uh, you know, are, are you going to have three copies of your data across all the different platforms? Or are you going to have it localized in one place? Um, you know, I, I, in addition to the fact that, you know, maybe having it um, localized in one place, it being your data, and, you know, maybe there are, maybe that's people have a machine running in some cabinet that, that stores all, all their data. I don't, that's, that's the image that comes to mind as kind of a, a techie person, um, but, uh, or, or uh, somewhere else, this, this idea that the data would be stored um, instead of spread out between a lot of places being stored at, at one location may offer some uh, sort of a new framing for this sustainability um, sort of question. Uh, I mean, another thing that comes to mind is that the, the data sort of grows according to the ability to store it. Um, it it's a gas that fills the space, the container that it's put in. Um, and I think that's, that's visible as, um, uh, as uh, Moore's law starts to slow down and um, some of these sort of tech uh, advancements become harder to get. Um, 
maybe uh, that, that will be more problematic as, as we won't see sort of the exponential growth of data, we'll see the, the slowing of data. Um, I don't know if that'll happen. That's on the table and it's something that um, I've heard being in kind of the computer science research area, the slowing down of Moore's law. Um, and uh, that, that may play in both sides. That may reduce the amount of data that we sort of work with every day, but it also reduces our ability to store old data. Um, so that's um, two questions for the future. Two questions. No answers. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, there's, there's a, there is a lot of research done on this, and it, I think um, I can't state anything which is absolute, but there's one group from um, University of Massachusetts group researchers who estimated that training one large AI model used in natural language processing could generate about the same amount of CO2 emissions as five cars would generate in their whole lifetime. So these are you know, things that we have to, to think about. Um, I was going to ask um, Shiv to come in on this as well. Shiv, um, Shiv if you've got any um, additional add-ins on this area, and also to ask you if you've heard about this concept of federated learning. Yeah, um, so I, this might be cheeky, but I wanted to just um, go back to the NFT conversation. Um, uh, if that's okay, is that really, like, are you gonna tell me off, Galen, uh, for going off piece? Yeah, sure. no, I think the NFT thing comes completely into this area of sustainability and, and as Serena's pointed out, yes. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, uh, I've also had lots of questions put to me about uh, proof of work uh, from people who are very serious, sort of in, in environmentalists in a sense. And I, and I think that proof of stake, uh, as Serena mentioned before, will hopefully, fingers crossed, sort that out. Um, but on the NFT thing, it's just, it, you know, it's, if people don't quite get how revolutionary this is, and this almost touches upon, I think, what um, Hannah uh, was asking, it, it's this, that, that old chestnut problem of kind of uh, Van Gogh, uh, however you want to pronounce that. Um, I'm going to go with Van Gogh. Uh, but, um, you know, he didn't get anything for his art, uh, but they sell for millions now. Right, that seems like a weird paradox, right? You're like, oh, that's strange. Well, NFT solved that problem. If you want to sort of make it very crude, um, they allow the revenue from ongoing art sales to be passed back to the artist. If you if you want to model it that way, but they allow for basically uh, creator control uh, to be returned back, uh, control of of assets which are, is a, obviously an asset, be passed back to the creator constantly and for that tie to always remain. And that's what's very exciting because now you can start to think about it with clothes, right? Like, all right, if you wanted to create fair trade systems, so we have fair trade systems, it's really hard to implement because you have this huge physical distance between where the clothes are created and where they end up retailing. Well, now you can do this digitally, right? You don't need people in, you know, checking and monitoring constantly what's going on. It doesn't have to be clothes, it could be anything, right? We all know about um, provenance and systems uh, where you know Apple is caught being caught, uh, caught foul of this in their factories at one point, et cetera, et cetera. So you know when you start doing this digitally, then it's much more interesting. Where, for example, you have a piece of clothing that when it retails, then the value is actually passed back to the people who create it, right? Then you can start to see real power redistributions because money is also uh, uh, or uh, yeah, money is also power in that sense, right? So um, this is how people make their living. Great, let's reform that. No, definitely. Um, so actually, I'm going to go to um, um, one of the polls again, actually. So just before we move forward, Raza, if you can hear me, could we put up um, the third poll for the audience, which actually is about medical data? Probably should have put it up earlier, but we'll get this in now. Are you positive about your medical data being used for the evolution of worldwide cures and vaccinations? such as for viruses like we've just seen with COVID-19. So this is about data for good. So I'll leave that poll there for people to add to. We'll get the results in a minute. Um, and just come forward into, um, just wanted to go back to the federated learning side. Mark, have you heard about federated learning? We've put a link in the chat box. Um, as far as I understand, basically it is where the training side of the algorithms and the, the, uh, uh, is actually not performed in large data centers, but over thousands of mobile devices using, really, it's a decentralized smartphone system, yeah, I think, and where the data is usually collected by the phone users themselves. Can you tell us any more about it? Yeah, no, that's a good summary. Um, 
the idea is um, instead of having one data center doing all this processing, there's there's processing available all over the place. Um, some of the sort of inspirations for this um, that uh, I'm familiar with, uh, there's a project called Folding at Home or SETI at Home um, using uh, sort of leftover computer time. So this is desktop computers uh, to fold proteins, which is a very computationally intensive problem yet um, one that's very valuable. Um, and then also analyzing um, data in the search for extraterrestri extraterrestrial life. So that kind of has its own, uh, you know, cult following its own audience um, and people are very happy to, um, you know, they'll send some data over and uh, to, the, to the individual's computer and then send that back. So the idea is, um, you know, maybe that um, offsets some of the costs in some ways. Um, there's also, um, I think it's called edge computing, mm. um, using using more um, low power devices. Again, jumping back to okay, the end of Moore's law, um, jumping uh, much deeper instead of this this idea where a computer kind of does everything um, equally well. It's sort of a jack of all trades. You build specific hardware to do one particular thing, and we've seen this with um, Bitcoin miners and, and um, machines like that um, that just ran, that do one thing very, very well. And this idea that uh, you can save um, a, a hundred, a thousand—I um, wouldn't be surprised if somebody told me a million uh, times the power uh, using these very specialized uh, circuits effectively. Um, now with blockchain, that means you just crank more power and you you run it faster, or you put layer more of them together. But um, as uh, you know, with machine learning, uh, you know you 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 reach some threshold and you say, hey, this is good enough, and then that that shrinks down the power that you need uh, so much more. Uh, so that's on the horizon. I <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but it's uh, there there are a couple. Um, it's been talked about a lot in the computer science department here, so. Great. It's, it's, looking, uh, it's, great. it's looking good. Now, I think these are all things that I wanted to, to bring up tonight so that we can take them further research and further look at them together. And like I've said in the introduction, we're not going to find the solutions today, but we can put these amazing options that are coming through to put on the table. Um, and I guess, Shiv, with the data union work you've been doing for quite a while yet in this preparation area, you know, you, you like me have seen these different options emerge across the years, yeah? And it's positive to start to hear about these um, more decentralized and the federation learning, I think is an interesting one to look at, yeah. It is. Um, so one aspect of that, by the way, is, is decentralized storage. So, you know, how you store your personal data, it doesn't have to be through, uh, you know, Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud or whatever, right? Um, it, it can actually now, basically in the last year, the system has existed, it's called IPFS. Uh, there are other decentralized solutions out there, um, but that's the one that's most popular at the moment. IPFS, uh, and it has the most use, um, allows you to basically store it in a decentralized way. So it could be on anyone's computer. Uh, there are other projects that are looking at how do you split that data up so it could be like small data chunks on uh, computers around the world. That's a much more difficult problem to solve. Um, but you have the private key that unlocks that data. So only you can access that data, and that's great. Um, it means that you know you don't have to worry about like storing your personal data on your computer, nor worrying about setting up an account with Google. Because why would you do that? No one will do that. So now it starts to make these things very flexible and very feasible. And then you end up with interesting solutions like this. What if you stored the data that was going to a data union? You just copy and pasted it to your personal storage vault. So you've got your own history of, you know, and you might be a member of several data unions, your Spotify data union, the wellness data union, your financial data union, let's say, and you've got all of that stored somewhere, but in a decentralized way. So no one person is taking advantage of it. And there's no central point of failure. Great. Then that's your identity. That starts to become your digital identity, but it's sovereign to you. You control it and you own it. Um, and people can query it in a zero knowledge way. So it maintains your privacy. All these things start to come together uh, and it's required a lot of other technological pieces to start to fit. And they've actually only come together in the last year. Um, and all the while you can also get paid for it, right? If that's what your game is, great, brilliant. That's your monetary incentive there as well for kind of being slightly active and hopefully most of the headaches removed because you've got professionals also working for you. So it's a really, it's a really interesting system. It's actually the system that Tim Berners-Lee has been working off, um, except he's decided to go off and build 
not in a Web3 way. And so it's not very interoperable, at least as what I've understood it uh, as. So he wants to kind of reinvent it all um, uh, in a different way. So that's, that's kind of interesting. But it, it's a good model. It's a really great model. And I, I think what you're describing is what for many of us and in the arts, definitely, and Serena's world too, in my world, and I've been looking for many years at this, like the merge between the data self and the physical self and actually how we hold that together as um, as our digital identity, as Luke Hockazen mentioned earlier too. And what I think is interesting about this also, as you're saying about earning, is that the, it, it's somewhere between $10,000 to $100,000 a year is earned by corporates from each of us for our from our data, from the sales of our data. And actually, if you th think about that in relationship to if we were earning that ourselves or actually even able to to gift it yeah, to others, that's where we potentially have the money lying to cross the digital divide and be able to share that, even if it was as access to data, yeah, into places and into people who are still not necessarily even accessing data at all, you know, either through the web or maybe just through a simple phone or whatever. So I think these are where this, this um, discussion between the individual and the collective comes to play. And as there's still, like you said, she's a long way to go on it and lots of things suddenly starting to happen. And that's why we've got to get everyone back together and talk about this again in the autumn as part of the University of Greenwich work, etc. So, Serena, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, because I know we've been talking your area a bit as well here. Yeah, absolutely. That's something, well, she was talking that I shared in the chat. I don't know if people have seen that, but there's a there's a project, for example, called Artweave that, for example, yeah, I see, I see you nodding, Shiv, yeah, that um, sure. um, differently from IPFS is actually storing not just like the file or an ash of the file, which will be like an ID, let's say, that can trace back a file, is actually storing the entire data. Um, so that means instead of like, putting a NASH, which in essence will be a string of code that will help you tracing back the original file and it's distributed in multiple computers, is actually storing the file. <laughs> so that's a project that um, I'm curious to see how it's going to develop because that could potentially preserve the knowledge of our societies in the future. Um, and something else also I wanted to mention is the fact that yesterday, for example, we've been working on a project and for some time, the internet went down, which sounds crazy to say, but there was a huge um, um, breakage of the internet. So we've been trying to do uh, some work and nothing was working. So in that sense, when our data you know, we rely on solutions that suddenly run online and our phone stop to work. Everything will stop and it will be incredibly difficult for us to deal with any type of situation because we're simply no longer used to live without all our devices or be connected. So I think it's also interesting to think what if those devices or those solutions may not be accessible to us for any like natural reason <laughs> that these you know that could happen so i think it's interesting always to keep that in mind and see how do we relate to that thank you thank you i've realized that of course we've run out of time and i want to say to just very quickly there's been some very good comments in the chat room thank you genevieve um, for pointing out young people don't have ownership and management of their own bio data um, in the education system and that is a problem we all know that and um, for Tracy Fellows, a colleague of mine, actually Tracy's just written a book on future identity. She's talking about the connected bodies um, uh, in the question she's put forward, connected bodies of cognitive data, which I think we must come back to another point, which is a more transhumanist view, actually, quite a um, transhumanist view of, of brains connected together and actually us all being connected anyway. So then all our personal data is everybody's anyway. So, and I know artists like Stanza have talked about this for 20 years or so as well, and in my own work with connected bodies too. So, but can I say thank you to everybody? We've got a lot more to go here. And I think for, even from this chat, I definitely can see the possibility to curate um, a lot more talks and symposiums and activities to bring us back together and others and all the active people who have been in the, in the chat box. Um, I'd like to thank Stacey Pizzolides, who's 
um, working on the data donating death, the digital death and donation of your body data, and Andy Forks, who's um, simulation training data. And um, I think I've seen Phoebe Moore, who's actually very much about workplace data and um, the productivity line data that happens by people who are covered in sensors all the time doing product line stuff or receptionist work. I think we do need to realise this is happening a lot in many African countries now. Digital ID is coming in and um, the digital ID issue is even linked to voting. Yeah, and voting and healthcare. When you're in a country and you can't get your digital ID and certain people have been left out and certain cultures have been left out in all of our problematic, non-democratic scenarios that are happening around the world. So can I thank everybody um, and remind you that we will be sending you links to the four webinars in the series and the resource documents that will be made from the chat room and from your input. So you'll be able to read the resource document and click through the links as you listen to the webinar. Um, and to stay in touch with us with any other projects or activities that you have linked to this, co this topic so that we can involve you onwards too. And let's all move forward on our research of this and continue to share because like Shiv said, there's so much happening. Every day I'm hitting stuff because it's one of my main areas of work, biometrics, etc. Um, and I'm completely amazed by actually how many companies are starting, how many different ideas and options are coming through. And there's definitely a feeling of a kind of mass conscious movement towards we've got to sort this out ethically. And we all know we've got to sort it out sustainably. We can't be in this situation where the world is having big problems with sustainability and we're, yet we're making more data. So that's making it worse and more worse and worse and worse. So let's move forward with a into a mode of creating positive future foresight for our descendants, because this isn't necessarily about the older ones of us here. It's actually about our kids and our kids' kids that are going to deal with this world onwards. So thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Shiv Malik, Mark Roman Miller, and Anna Luisa and Serena, thank you a lot. And just want to say you two have come through the, my, the, the, the Deutsche Bank, Women Entrepreneurs in Social Tech, scheme which I was spokesperson for so I know you both very well from that work and I'm really proud of these two new companies that are coming forth so strongly into the world as women entrepreneurs in tech and Sybil's Sybil as well Anna Luisa's partner and also thank you to um, all of the events team at Greenwich to um, Fakar Raza, Karen Ward, to um, Suzanne Lowell and also to Brie Powell, who's work, works with Body Database with me, who's been adding lots into the, into the moderation box too. Thank you to all the chairs and the speakers from the previous webinars too. And do, when you get the link, have a look at the previous three as well. And if you do Twitter, go and, look at, go and check the Twitter stream now and add in or retweet further, please. There's a lot of happening in LinkedIn on this as well, around this debate. And um, if you check me out and other people. So... Good luck to everybody onwards, and I hope we can get together again soon. Thank you to all the attendees. Sorry we didn't answer all the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Galen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye.